Hmm. Okay. Computer. It's a simple word. But if you think of it, this word has been radically redefined since being coined in the 1600s. At first, it actually referred to people. People who did calculations or observed or surveyed things. Then, it was used to refer to really large mechanical machines. Machines that are much bigger than the rooms most of you are in. And now, computers are, well, everywhere. There are electronic devices. Laptops are computers. Tablets are computers. Phones, watches, even your refrigerator. It's all so... startling. Which is also another curious word. It is unique because it's the only nine-letter word that can have a letter taken away, one at a time, and still have nine different words made out of it. From startling, to starting, to staring, string, sting, sing, sin, in, I was in an exam the other day, and I was supposed to upload my solutions online. Because, well, it's 2020. I mean, 2021. So, yeah, I'm just about done converting all of the PNGs to PDF, and the laptop stops working. Just in time. As I was contemplating the pros and cons of throwing my laptop through the window whilst reminding myself that, after Uncle Sam took his cut of my money, I am just way too broke to buy another one right now. So I tried to actually solve the issue. How do I fix this, I thought. It was a low battery, so maybe connect it to the charger? Just to use my phone instead? I don't know, make a paper plane out of my answer sheet and shoot it in the direction of my professor's office? Or you know, just turn it off and then turn it back on again? I chose the last option because, well, it's the most known hack in all of technology. And sure enough, it worked. This trick has a lot of applications, apparently. In addition to saving your degree, turning things off and on has potentially saved even plane crashes. The Boeing 788 Dreamliner, an apparently state-of-the-art long-haul aircraft, actually needs its computers to be turned off manually every 51 days. Known more formally as power cycling, this supposedly simple thing is done to prevent stale data from overpopulating the plane's systems. Without power cycling, the plane's digital instruments may reflect misleading information, including faulty airspeed, altitude, and other critical info. For some aircraft, the screens can actually time out if the power is left connected for too long. Talk about the blue screen of death when you're 35,000 feet in the air. Now, while loss of certain data during a flight isn't necessarily the end of the world, the risk of a technical failure often needs to be qualified with which phase of the flight it takes place in. During the critical stages of a flight, such as takeoff or landing, such a failure could have catastrophic consequences. Turning the plane off and turning it on again, as it turns out, is quite common practice. And some of you might have experienced this power cycling before. Remember when you were waiting for the plane to taxi and suddenly all the lights and air conditioning went off for a second? That might as well be the maintenance staff or the crew turning it off and turning it back on again. 51 days. That's around 7 weeks. And a week has 7 days. But wait. Why does a week have 7 days? And why are the weekends one after another instead of one other arrangement? Well, as it turns out, as with most of the original calendar inspiration, the seven days of the week were inspired from the seven planets thought to be part of the solar system at the time. As for the weekends, well, in 19th century Britain, the Sundays were reserved for religious practice only, which is of course how many still use it for today. However, people apparently relaxed a bit too much on Sunday, and not showing up for work on Monday became a real problem. It was then that factory owners decided that Saturday would be a half day as well, in a desperate bid to ensure productivity and give workers just a little extra time. Another idea is that, in the 1930s, some factories had to maximize productivity to avoid an economic crisis. Turns out, they did too good of a job, and they started producing surplus, which was a problem because that could actually lead to people without work, leading to, you guessed it, another economic crisis. So according to that theory, we have two weekends not because people weren't working well, but because they were working too well. With so many people these days working from home, 24-7 financial markets, and the larger landscape around office work looking to change for good, who knows what the idea of a weekend will be in the future. Only time will tell. Speaking of time, it has been quite a while since humans have been on this planet. And in that time, we have evolved to have larger brains, bipedality, mullets, and poor eyesight? Wait, where did the poor eyesight come from? 
You'd imagine that not being able to properly see a predator would be very bad for someone's chances of survival. And the genes that led to such faulty vision should have been removed from the gene pool through evolution, right? Well, why hasn't evolution taken care of it then? Of course, there is an age element to it, as with every ailment. Poor eyesight is way more common in the elderly, at which point they have fulfilled their evolutionary responsibilities and are no longer being selected for or against. But a sizable chunk of youth need corrective lenses too. Oh, by the way, when your mom told you watching too much TV caused your blurry vision, she was lying. Kind of. But yeah, back to evolution. So really, why isn't evolution taking care of poor eyesight? Well, for one, our ancestors weren't really reading tiny fonts off of a screen, so farsightedness probably wasn't an issue. But even for short-sightedness, the condition was prevalent in some, but not all. So people just collaborated and looked out for each other. That's the theory, anyways. Now, we have civilization in all its glory coming up with ways to restore perfect vision to more people than ever before. If you think of it, we are quite literally fighting evolution, and in doing so, preserving the genes of people with poor eyesight from dying out. If you're ever mad at having to wear glasses, well, you now have civilization to blame for it. Now you know. One thing that is improving with time, however, is our average lifespan. Or is it? You see, average lifespan and average life expectancy are two terms that are often used interchangeably. Are they really the same thing, though? Average life expectancy is how long someone is expected to live. This metric often takes into account the healthcare facilities in a country, mortality rates, causes of mortality, and so on, and is often used to compare a country's socioeconomic progress. Average lifespan, on the other hand, is really referring to something more like a shelf life metric. How long can you biologically last, basically? Now, the average life expectancy all over the world has been going up in general, and that's a great thing. We have more access to medication, comparatively safer methods of transport, more vaccines, and whatnot. However, we actually haven't increased our average lifespan all that much. Yes, people died really early back in the hunter-gatherer times, it was a brutal existence after all. Life expectancy rose all the way from about 35 years to around 75. However, people that were able to escape famine, plagues, wars did live decently long. Healthcare was obviously not very good back then. What this shows, instead, is how far good genes can get you. In a 1994 study that looked at 397 Greeks and Romans that lived before and after 100 BC, about 100 of them died in battle, suicide, or other violent manners. For those that were able to survive through these things, though, the median age was actually 72. For those born after 100 BC, the median age was 66. History has many other examples of people living pretty long once they were able to escape the common causes of death at the time. Today, we haven't expanded the biological limits of life all that much. We've simply delayed the causes of death our ancestors had to deal with. But if you're suddenly uncertain about how long you're going to live, don't worry too much. Just count your heartbeat. Like, really. As silly as that sounds, the number of beats can be a surprisingly accurate indication for the lifespan of mammals. All mammals have a set number of beats, about a billion, and what determines how long they live is basically how fast they go through those beats. Basically, how fast their heart beats. On the far end of the scale is the Etruscan shrew, which has a resting heart rate of 835 beats per minute, which is well over 10 times that of humans. It's no surprise, then, that the Etruscan shrew only lives for about two years, despite being kind of cute. On the complete opposite end of the scale is the bowhead whale, it has a lifespan of around 200 years. It follows, then, that the bowhead whale has a heart rate of a measly 10 beats per minute. If you had a heart rate around that, you're already dead. Just kidding. You might have an extreme version of bradycardia, though. Now, I kinda lied when I said this would work for you. For whatever reason, us humans don't actually follow this rule. We have an extra billion beats to go through. And as you're going through them, Maybe watch a movie? And then watch the trailer as well? Wait, why would you watch a movie and then watch its trailer? Actually, that's why they're called trailers. Trailers were originally shown after a movie, but that was seen to be ineffective in that audiences just left after the movie was finished. Today, trailers are known to us more as previews and are crucial components in ensuring a box office presence. But if you're not feeling like movies too much, 
Maybe watch someone flip a coin? Contrary to popular belief, it's not actually 50-50 all the time. For a penny, for example, the head's side is slightly heavier than the tail's side. That means the center of gravity is tilted a bit towards the head's side, and that side is therefore more likely to face down, giving you more tails than heads. So coin tosses aren't 50-50. But you know what is? The Haskell Free Library and Opera House. It's a Victorian building deliberately built on the US-Canada border between Derby Line, Vermont, and Quebec. It actually has two separate addresses, one for America and the other for Canada. The front door to the building is on the US side, and the books are on the Canada side, and the reading rooms are considered international. The library has over 20,000 books, some of which are English and some of which are French. Something that is not French, however, is a croissant. What the? I know. But croissants are... I, I know. How can that be, right? Croissants are the most French thing there is. Well, croissants actually originated in Vienna, Austria. Over there, it was called a kipfro. In fact, until as recent as the 19th century, the only way to get a croissant in France was from an Austrian bakery in Paris. So, I guess you've been lied to your entire life. We aren't living any longer than we used to. Coin tosses aren't 50-50. Trailers play after movies and croissants aren't French. They really do be like that sometimes. Today's video was sponsored by Morning Brew, the daily email that makes reading the news actually enjoyable. There's a lot of useless information out there as we've seen. I mean, we spend hours upon hours every day mindlessly scrolling on Twitter and Instagram, and we don't really retain any of it. It's imperative to stay up to date with what's going on in the world, and to do that, I use Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a free daily newsletter that gets sent out seven days a week directly to your inbox. In less than five minutes a day, I'm up to date on everything business, finance, and technology. Traditional news can be, well, quite a bit boring. But with Morning Brew, I'm caught up on everything I need to be before I even get out of bed in the morning. I found this actually saved me a lot of time over the course of three months of using it, and is a much better alternative to scrolling through social media two minutes after I wake up. I'm personally really into the world of finance, and each and every day I can stay up to date with key sectors I'm interested in. Bitcoin had its worst month in four and a half years, so it's probably a good time to buy the dip. Morning Brew is completely free for everyone to use. If you click the link at the top of the description, you can sign up to Morning Brew in less than 15 seconds. After that, you're all set. Subscribing to Morning Brew has had a positive impact on my daily life, and I imagine it'll do the same for you as well. You'll not only be supporting my channel, but you'll be keeping yourself up to date with reality at the same time.